And we'll be making our final visit to the excavations of Sutton Hoo at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon. of lights, fashion, romance, culture. A city which within a year should only be three hours away from London by train. And home to a series of grand projects designed to make this the most modern, the most advanced, the capital city of Europe. Because when it comes to making things happen, the French embrace new ideas with almost as much enthusiasm as they embrace each other. notice about this city is the architecture. The second is the traffic. It's the thing that Parisians hate most about their city. Every day, three million people drive into Paris, belching out noise and fumes. And the cars are just as bad. But not me today. I'm feeling just a little bit virtuous because although I'm obviously contributing to the traffic jam here, I'm not contributing to the pollution in the Parisian atmosphere because I'm driving an electric car and if all goes well, very soon a lot of other people will be too. In a few months, the French begin a major project designed to put them well ahead of the rest of Europe in the race to get electric cars on the road. At first, these will be hired out, but the French car makers believe that with the right encouragement, within three years, 50,000 people will have taken the plunge and actually bought one. electric car drivers, the government and the electricity companies are building a network of rapid recharging stations. At the moment, the only recharging station in Paris is here at an exhibition at the Science Museum. You pay by credit card and you connect up in the same way that you do at a petrol station. Then, using massive amounts of direct current, this can deliver two hours worth of normal charging in just ten minutes. At the end of 10 minutes, when your car and bank account have been appropriately charged, you can take up where you left off. By 1995, all major French cities should be fully equipped with recharging terminals. And by then, some rather more unusual electric cars should be zipping around the streets of Paris. <laughs> tons of coins were unloaded from parking meters in Paris. A heavy load. So what's the solution? Smart cards.
Finished a hundred years ago, it was the tallest building in the world. For something of this size, it's remarkably light and strong. Even in heavy winds, it hardly sways at all. And it gets that strength from its structure. The smaller struts become the larger struts, which in turn become the legs. They then fuse to become the whole. It's a brilliant piece of engineering, but in a sense, all Eiffel did was copy nature because inside our bodies, we have similar crisscross structures which are light but very strong, bones. It's not obvious from the outside, but bone is made of lots of interlocking struts and empty spaces. It has to cope with lots of stress, sometimes more than it can bear. This is the only operating theatre in the world with a magnificent view of the Eiffel Tower, although it's not being appreciated at the moment by the patient, Antonio Morgano, because he's having a major operation on his leg. He was involved in a car accident which broke his bones. This was followed by infection of the bone, which left large holes. These now have to be filled by the surgeon, Dr. Serotto, who's going to use a new bone substitute, coral. French scientists are the first to appreciate the potential of coral, which is structurally very similar to bone. This is not as surprising as it sounds, because coral is itself a skeleton made by tiny sea creatures called polyps to protect themselves. Side by side under the microscope, it's difficult to tell which is which. The holes, once home to the tiny creatures that made this piece of coral, are very important. They're just the right size to attract osteoblasts, cells in our bodies that make bone. So the coral acts as scaffolding, round which real bone can grow. Equally important, coral is made of calcium carbonate, a mineral sufficiently like bone not to be rejected by our immune systems. Instead, as new bone grows, the coral is gradually absorbed. We're halfway through this rather gruesome operation done under local anaesthetic. Dr. Serotto believes the coral will improve Antonio's life. When I saw him for the first time, he could hardly walk. He was walking with a, a stick. So I decided to remove all the infections inside the bone and in the same place I put coral. The coral has been shaped to fit the hole in Antonio's leg. Dr. Serotto is now carefully tapping it into place. So how soon will Antonio be able to walk? Tomorrow morning. It will be strong? If it's not too painful, that's all. That's good. Otherwise, in two or three days. After the operation, Antonio's leg was x-rayed to check that the pieces of coral are deeply embedded in the right place. And by the following morning, Antonio was up and smiling, if not exactly walking. He's now well on the way to recovery. Point zero. All road distances in France are measured from here. It's a symbolic centre of the country, the very heart of Paris, and the home of Notre Dame. It stood here through 700 years of the city's turbulent history, but the 20th century has been the hardest one yet. Just go and have a look for it. Are we more likely to find something Yeah. The problem is the tourists. Notre Dame is top of the tourist hit list. Nearly 10 million people come and go through these doors every year. That's the equivalent to the entire population of Belgium. <laughs> The tourists bring in dirt, dust and water vapour.
Add to that the soot of a million candles. The result? One sticky mess. It got into the nooks and crannies, stuck to the stonework and clogged up the magnificent organ. Something had to be done. With French heritage at stake, the government stepped in to restore the organ to its former glory. All of its pistons and bellows were stripped down and rebuilt. Every one of its 8,000 pipes was taken out and cleaned by hand. But they didn't just leave it there. Electrified, computerized and digitized, the organ is wired for sound and in true French fashion it uses a smart card. Monsieur Lefebvre, yours I believe. Playing an organ like this is a complicated affair. Each of these stops controls a different group of pipes. Change the group and you change the sound the organ makes. But there are hundreds of stops and thousands of possible combinations. Now, with just one push of a button, all those combinations can be pre-programmed and called up on demand. And because Monsieur Lefebvre is just one of several organists at Notre Dame, his personalised smart card only calls up the combinations he likes best. The whole keyboard has been fitted out with sensors which convert every note and nuance into a digital code. It's all stored on computer and can be played back at will. So if Monsieur Lefebvre takes the day off, the music plays on. Of course, heritage and high-tech don't always play in harmony. The odd power surge has led to a few embarrassing silences. But as the teething problems are ironed out, the cathedral is getting back in tune with its history. of Le Rugby, Wales will be put to the sword by France. France will then rightly emerge as champions of Europe, or at least that's what the French tell me. But while it's sacrilege to say so, I haven't really come here to watch the match. I've come to look at the adverts. Not surprisingly, many of these are aimed at a French audience. But the match itself is being watched in 12 countries, and from the point of view of the advertisers, that audience is being wasted, which is why they've come up with this. Nothing's really happening to the billboard. It's just that the picture you're receiving is being manipulated electronically. The whole idea is that the French television audience will see their adverts in French, the Welsh will see them in Welsh, and the Tomorrow's World audience will, of course, see Tomorrow's World adverts. Now, something superficially very similar has been used for a long time in television and films to achieve special effects. What you do is you put a patch of blue into the shot, you electronically suck the blue out of the picture, and then you can put any kind of background picture into the shot that you like. The trouble is, it doesn't work if you move. Now, watch what happens if I move and the camera moves with me. The effect is ruined. With the new technique, you pinpoint your target and the system will then stick tenaciously to it, however much the camera moves. This is actually a spin-off of French military research into making smart bombs. Smart bombs are guided to a target by laser beams, but for added accuracy, they're taught to recognize and aim for a flat surface, for example, a wall or a door. Like the bomb, this system works by recognising flat surfaces, in this case, billboards. 
the point of all of this is to help advertisers improve sales. But as a viewer, I'd be much happier if they used it to remove adverts altogether. But I think that's about as likely as Wales winning this afternoon. Come on, Wales! Lovely tackle by Lewis on there to Cheshire Long. Cheshire Long marvellously to Weber. Weber over the 22. A real chance for Benetton. Can he score his second try? Indeed he can. And that's the killer blow. No introductions necessary for this famous face, although there are plenty of question marks about who this mysterious woman really was. The Mona Lisa isn't the only puzzle in the Louvre Museum. There are thousands of works of art on display here, and many of them hold on to secrets of their own. How old they are. Where they come from. Are they really what they seem? To get to the bottom of it all, scientists have been brought in with the heavy artillery. They're blasting away at fragile and precious works of art down in the basement. It's 25 meters long, weighs 10 tons, and costs one and a half million pounds. You won't find one of these in any other museum in the world because this is a particle accelerator, the sort of machine that's normally more at home in a physics lab unraveling the secrets of the Big Bang or the origins of the universe. Well, the job of this particular hulk of metal is slightly less grand. It's being used to shed some light on flints. Take this Egyptian knife. Very ornate, but was it actually put to any use? The traditional way to find out is to take a very close look at any scratches left behind on the blade. It's more a matter of judgment than of measurement. But what you really want is a much closer look. And that's where this comes in. It can tell you exactly what's left stuck to the surface of a flint, even thousands of years on, without damaging it in any way. A flint's put at one end, and at this end, a beam of subatomic particles is produced, which is squeezed, concentrated, and pushed through a series of magnets and vacuums, and then squeezed and pushed again, until the particles are travelling at up to 30,000 kilometres a second. They come shooting out of here and slam into the flint inside here. This enormous amount of energy knocks individual molecules of the flint sideways, and that produces X-rays, which are picked up by a sensor. Different types of molecules produce different patterns of X-rays, and it's those patterns which show up anything unusual left on the surface. Like this one, it shows quite clearly that the flint was used to cut bone. Forget the peak over here, that's silicon, which is what flints are made out of. But these two peaks over here, phosphorus and calcium, and together they spell bone. Fascinating stuff, but you might be forgiven for expecting a bit more from a multi-million pound machine. Well, researchers do have bigger targets in sight. And there are pressing questions to answer. Is the air in the galleries eating away at irreplaceable works of art? Just how old are the old masters, or are they later copies? And where do they start with the secrets of 300,000 treasures to unravel? French writer once said, to err is human, to shop is Parisian.
right, one Rue de l'Internationale. This is it. It doesn't look much, but what's going on inside this very ordinary building is at the leading edge of an international project that's as big and as expensive as anything going on in science at the moment. The project's being compared to the attempts to put men on the moon, but its implications for our children and our children's children are far greater. This is the biologist's answer to the philosopher's question, what makes a human being? It's DNA. And in the vat behind me, cooled by liquid nitrogen, they've collected the essence of 8,000 people. Now, I've been describing DNA for years. This is actually the first time that I've handled some. And it still amazes me to think that stuff like this decides all of my physical characteristics, from the curliness of my hair to the shape of my eyes. DNA is an instruction manual on how to make a person. It's written in a very strange language, just four letters repeated three billion times. What they're trying to do here is decipher the whole manual. But this building is also a gathering place for children who are unlucky enough to inherit DNA that gives out the wrong instructions. All the children who come here, like Rafiq, have an inherited problem with their muscles which are slowly wasting away. Most of them will die at a tragically young age. To speed up the search for a cure for this and many other genetic diseases, the French muscular dystrophy charity that represents these children is raising eight million pounds every year to support the research going on here. A lot of the money has gone into machines. This is the world's first attempt to put genetic research on a production line basis. The workers here are robots, endlessly plugging away at the mind-bogglingly dull task of analysing samples of DNA. These do the equivalent work of about 60 laboratories and can run unsupervised around the clock. By using this production line technique, the group here have raced ahead of the rest of the world. By the end of this year, they expect to have produced the crude outline of the whole Manual of Man, and that's two years ahead of schedule. I say crude, though, because what they expect to produce won't be detailed. If you think of DNA as a map, then what they've done is established the general shape of the city and found a few major landmarks. They're still some way off, creating a complete street map, let alone listing each of the houses in each of the streets, which is their ultimate goal. But the project is progressing at a speed undreamt of until a few years ago, and it's spurred on by the hope that the children here will ultimately benefit from the research, research which would never have started without the money they helped to raise. What's the difference between a hamburger and the opera? Nothing. They're both cheap and easily available, apart from the opera. Now that stupendous joke might not work in the future if the French succeed in turning the principles of fast food it's a fast art. Now over there is the city's new opera house. It's the biggest in the world and a brainchild of the president. He wanted to celebrate the country's 200th birthday in style and a new opera house fitted the bill perfectly. But like the fast food industry, it had to be big with a high turnover. And because this is France, truly democratic too, with cheap seats and good views and acoustics for all. A tall order which needed a high-tech helping hand. Before building big, the scientists started small. The model they used to test the acoustics was scaled down to perfection. Miniature microphones recorded the scaled down sound from a tiny electric spark. Thousands of recordings were analyzed to see how the design would affect the sound. No echoes and it's tinny and cheap. Too many echoes and it sounds a mess. The study took two years, but this is the result. 
In the end, just the shape of part of the ceiling and the back wall had to be changed to make the most out of the auditorium. Even the seats were put to the test. These holes have been carefully designed to absorb the same amount of sound a body would if the seat were occupied. So even if the place is half empty, the acoustics don't change. So what does all this mean? Well, you should get the same sound quality in this section as you do over here, and for a fraction of the price. But bringing opera to the people doesn't just depend on what's happening out there. It's got to be affordable. To get the maximum value out of a place like this, you've got to stage as many performances as possible. But because every different opera uses truckloads of different scenery, they've had to invest in the latest scene-shifting technology to move things along. The whole stage is a gigantic lift which can bring scenery up in seconds from a massive storeroom 20 metres below. There's more space off stage, enough for five sets. They're mounted on trolleys, so whenever a particular set is needed, a control panel is plugged in and it can be driven on single-handed. It may be big, but is it a success? Some critics say that despite the huge costs and all that research, that it hasn't lived up to expectations. There have been criticisms about the acoustics. I must admit, though, I'm really looking forward to finding out for myself. <laughs> Paris. I hope you've enjoyed the show. We'll be back in London next week. Till then, good night. Well, Judith, here we are. Paris in springtime and the night's still young. It is, isn't it? See you tomorrow. Just another find, but a whole